powerful. Who even says recording in progress? Okay. Fancy. Ooh. Did you guys hear that? Yes, and it yeah. says continue on my thick end. Or it says continue or leave meeting. Oh, it's probably uh, taking account certain laws by certain states. Okay, that makes sense. I'm going to stay, everyone. Kristen Long, Life Enhancement Consultant, give you a big and beautiful shout out on this Thursday Q&A transformation. Before we begin, let us invoke. <clears throat> Place your hands on your heart. I'm going to mute you, cuties. Mute. Oh, mute. Perfect. Place your hands on your heart. Be aware of the love in your heart. Feel the expansion within the heart. Again, don't do this by rote. Don't do this speedy Gonzalez method. You really want to tap into the love in the heart. The more often you do it, the easier it will be and the faster you can do it. And be aware of the crown. Feel the crown expanding. And be aware of the heart and the crown together. To the Supreme God, Divine Father, Divine Mother, the Grand Master Cho Kuk Sui, Lord Mahaguru Jamiling, the Lord Buddha Kuan Yin, the Lord Ganesh, to Saraswati, the Holy Master Count Saint Germain, to all the Holy Gurus, Holy Masters, Saints, Archangels, Holy Angels, Healing Angels, Healing Ministers, to our Divine Selves, our Higher Souls, we humbly invoke for your Divine Light, Love and Power, for your Divine Help, Guidance and Protection, we ask for honesty, accurate perception, and correct expression towards oneself and others. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you all with tremendous gratitude, respect, and the deepest of love. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. In full faith. So be it. So be it. And so it is. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everyone. Oh, that changed it quickly. Um, thank you so much for being on. And thank you so much for those of you who sent questions. I have enough questions for probably two weeks out now. So I appreciate that. Um, and I will add that to the list. <clears throat> this we had together, these questions we had together about a week and a half ago. And then when I was traveling, I could not for the life of me, two different times, get on to find any Wi-Fi that was reliable. And I thought I'm in a major city, not a major, major city, not like a New York or Chicago or LA, but I'm in this city and I was expecting, oh, no problem, Wi-Fi, easy peasy. Nope, wasn't the case. And then other places, it was just, um, you know, in the middle of nowhere. So there wasn't many opportunities there, but um, my body is very tired. Who would have thought having so much fun could be so exhausting? So you guys have heard of stress, right? Stress, which has a certain physiological effect on the body. But then you have something called eustress, which is good kind of stress, like, traveling around, seeing beautiful places, interacting with new interesting people, connecting with friends. But doing that over and over and over and over again, it creates similar effects in the body, which is called eustress. So the experience, the emotional experience from not so good stress to eustress is different, but the physiological impact of stress and eustress is the same, almost, almost exactly the same. I think my body is experiencing a little bit of, um, you know, the, the side effects of traveling and seeing new things and doing new things and new experiences, blah, 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 blah. So it'll be good to have a couple of days to recalibrate before I go to, you guys know where I'm going? No? Uh, so this is, you guys are in the inner circle. So I guess get to know earlier. So um, my mentor and I, we, plopped open a map of the United States. And as you, as you guys know, I've been traveling around for 27, uh, 27 days. I'll be finishing the month out on Monday. And um, it was for the purpose of finding out well, where am I going to hang my hat for a prolonged period of time? Because I wasn't feeling called to go to anywhere and I wasn't being really repelled. So I was kind of in this um, limbo, this twilight energy. Like, where do I go? So we opened it up and we looked around. So we looked at it clairvoyantly, you know, looking at the inner world. And then we also scanned it energetically. And so she said to me, okay, well, what do you see? Where are the bright spots on the United States for you, right? This isn't saying, oh, well, this place is clean and bright and healthy because it is. It's more of the invoking and asking for guidance. 
what's the right spot for me to go, right? Because it could be for different for different people for different purposes. So I ended up finding um, Des Moines, Iowa. I know that feeling. I wondered that for years. What what's the feeling of the twilight? Trying to... Hold on, guys. We're waiting for a text. Oh, got it. Where to live? Yeah, I've actually never really been. I've always been guided, right? I'm just like, oh, like when I went to Denver, I was traveling the country with a friend for six months, and we we hit Denver for two weeks, and we hit Colorado Springs for two weeks. We were in Colorado. I'd never been to Colorado before, and I said. Denver, like that's it, super clear. And I was there for eight years, but then I was pushed out energetically from uh, from Denver. And then I went to Montana and I thought, hey, Montana is a place I can hang my hat. But then being there for a prolonged period of time, it didn't resonate with me, right? It, it, it got me there for a certain purpose. The purpose was mostly fulfilled and then it was time to move on. So as we were looking, she goes, well, what do you see? I said, Des Moines, Iowa in Madison, Wisconsin. I've been to Des Moines 20 years ago. I've been to Madison, Wisconsin, August of 2015 to take Kriya Shakti with Master Co. And one of the senior practitioners lives has lived in Madison, Wisconsin for about 20 years. So it would make sense, right? There's brightness, there's you know constantly blessing the area after Twin Hearts Meditation. So there's spiritual energy that's being grounded and rooted into that area. But then I was like, huh, Okay, well, let's let's do a little research. So I went on, I looked at Airbnbs, I looked at hotels, and it's not a typical Airbnb of like, I'm gonna stay here for three days and then move on, where I'm gonna be at this hotel for three days and move on. I'm looking for a place I can stay for two months, right? So I'm looking, 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 nothing's resonating. Madison, okay, we'll put that off to the side. Even though Madison, Wisconsin came super high recommended in many, many different lists of the best places to live in the United States. Then Des Moines, Iowa came at the top of many lists of the best place to live in the United States. It's actually the fr um, friendliest, I think the friendliest city in the United States. And I was like, okay, couldn't find any Airbnbs that resonated, couldn't find any um, hotels that resonated. And it wasn't making sense. I go, the prices are way higher than they should be for these little tiny towns, you know, Midwestern towns. And so then I was looking at Delaware. I'd never been to Delaware. I was like, ah, oh, Delaware, there's prosperity energy. It's right by the water. I could be there for two months. I'm not a big fan of the East Coast. I grew up on the East Coast. I know the East Coast relatively well. I just never have been to Delaware. So I'm looking at um, uh, Dover, Delaware, the capital. Seems good. Seems okay. But again, the places aren't resonating. I'm looking at the Airbnbs, looking at the energy, scanning it, finding out the directions, and they're not there. There's something off. And I go, all right, I think I need to detach. I need, I need to let go. So I end up letting go, woke up the next morning, and then somebody in my Facebook liked something, like, like hearted one of my posts, whatever it was, a picture, a quote, I don't know what it was. And I thought, wait a minute. I know this person really well. This person is an Arhatic Yogi. This person also owns a large piece of land and has several houses, several little houses on this piece of land and rents these pieces of these little houses out as Airbnbs. And I go, why didn't I think of this earlier? So then I messaged her. I said, can we talk? I told her what my plan was. And within one hour, the agreement was set. I sent her the money for the first month and everything was taken care of. It was effortless super, super smooth, like butter, right? And I go, huh, that's what I was being guided because to go back to the original point of looking at the map of the United States energetically, the two, the two parts that were right were the area of Des Moines, Iowa in Madison, Wisconsin, but there was a third area that was super bright and it was in a, the Southwest part of the country but I thought nothing of it because I don't really resonate with the Southwest part of the country. So I didn't think much of it when we were doing the experiment. But then as I reflected back and I looked at where she is in relationship to that light, it was exactly that spot. Now you might be asking, well, where is it? Sedona, the crown chakra 
of the United States. <laughs> never been to Sedona, never really had an interest in going to Sedona. But as I looked at it and I got the feedback from my mentor and I got the effortlessness from the person there, energy is great, especially for doing spiritual work. Hello. So I was super, super jacked up about that. Um, you love the energy there, of course. Did you own a, a ranch there, Indiana, for 15, 20 years? Horse ranch? No? Okay. Uh, the state of Iowa is offering money for people to move from inner city of Chicago to Iowa. That's why I was told when I was in Des Moines. No kidding. Interesting. Yeah, Des Moines, from what I understand from 20 years ago to now, because when I was there 20 years ago, the whole city was under construction, practically, the roads and everything else. I've had several clients that within the past three months have been to Des Moines and they said they loved it. They had a great time there. I went to retreat there and so did Bridget. Oh, that's adorable. Yeah. So this place is owned by an Arhatic yogi. Weird. And uh, funny enough, she does Airbnbs year round. And she goes, strangely enough, I always have everything booked months in advance, but I only have one place that's open for the two months that you need it. It's booked before and it's booked after. She goes, maybe it's meant to be. And I go, maybe it is. So again, lots of gratitude to the great ones and showing the way. But again, this goes back to what one of you had a question earlier. It's not on today's list about discernment, about discernment. So to, discernment is looking at as many factors as possible with using as many tools as possible. So scanning is one thing tool that we use in pranic healing, feeling the energy because everything has energy around it. So if you say, I'm looking for this job opportunity, job opportunity A, job opportunity B, job opportunity C, which one, excuse me, which one should I choose? They all have energy, true or not true. So you scan which one has more energy, which one has denser energy. Well, Christian, why does dense energy mean anything? The dense of the energy of the thing, if it's clean, which you can tell the difference, it means it will materialize faster, right? Because you need energy to materialize something and the denser the energy, the more physical it is, right? So you can scan it for materialization energy. You can scan it for prosperity energy. You can scan it for happiness energy. You can scan anything for anything, right? So that's a form of discernment, scanning. What about clairvoyance? Looking at something, right? And obviously that requires more training, more purification, more understanding to be good at clairvoyance. But as you look at something clairvoyantly, right? Which chakra deals with wisdom, the forehead. It allows you to see the inner world. You go, aha, that's the answer, right? So, and there are levels of seeing the inner world. That's why clairvoyance is very, very difficult to be accurate in. Because your, you may not know what level of truth, what time period, what dimension, et cetera, you're viewing something in, right? But the cool thing is when you get more acclimated to using your forehead chakra, it becomes super, it becomes super efficient. Like you know things very easily. You look at it and you go, that's it. And so the doubt kind of goes away after you have enough practical experience of like, well, I saw that three times in a row and each time was accurate. So th then you start relying and trusting in your clairvoyance more often. Same thing with scanning. People doubt their scanning ability. Like Master Ko is famous for not feeling any energy for four years. And he was teaching classes on how others can feel energy because it's a protocol. Step one, do this. Step two, do this. Step three, do this. And again, you don't need to feel in order to heal. It took him four years to feel anything. And then it took him another four years to develop the skill of accurately scanning something. So probably Master Nona and Master Marilag would be some of the top scanners in pranic healing. Their level of accuracy is um, amazing because it, they're sensitive. It's easy for them to feel the inner world. Master Ko is not sensitive. It doesn't mean he's not developed. It doesn't mean if you are sensitive, you're developed. It just means he couldn't, he couldn't get the nuanced energies, right? And I made a joke with him, not a joke. It was a, a point in one of the classes years ago. 
I said, what does it mean? Or yeah, what does it mean if you're, you get less sensitive as you get older and more advanced in your practices? Meaning when I started pranic healing or hatha yoga 17 years ago, I was super sensitive, right? And I said, my sensitivity has changed. It's not the same as it used to be. I go, is that a good thing or a bad thing? He said, without skipping a beat, he goes, consider yourself lucky. I was like, whoa, why would I consider myself lucky? And now guess what I've just gone through? The past year and a half, another upgrade. And now my bodies are very sensitive to almost everything. So there's, there's, a, there's a plus and minus to being sensitive. Sensitive means you can tap into things and get information faster. But at the same time, you have to control it through the will constantly. You don't really ever get to rest. It doesn't really turn off. You can, you have to use the will to turn it on or turn it off, but in general, it's on almost all the time. So you also pick up your environment, right? So it's, there's pluses and minuses. And then the people who are not sensitive, yes, they may not be able to access information as quickly in the inner world, but at the same time, they're not being inundated and overwhelmed with the energies of the inner and outer worlds. Does that make sense? So it, it has pluses and minuses. Okay. So um, question number one. Dun, dun, dun. Unicorns, mermaids, what are the names of other elementals and their and are there meditations? Unicorns, mermaids, what are the names of other elementals and are there meditations? Very good question. It's a little bit outside of the scope of what we do as in, as in the meditations. So what do I mean by that? So in pranic healing, our hatha yoga are both systems. Pranic healing is a healing system. Our hatha yoga is a spiritual system. And they, they work in tandem with one another. So when you do our hatha yoga meditations, your energy expands, and then you use that energy to heal people, right? And then as you heal more people, your cup gets emptied, and then you meditate and you fill up your cup and your cup gets bigger and you fill it up faster. So they work together with one another, right? Um, so there are meditations of working with the elements, which if you want greater understanding about that, you can read Initiation into Hermetics by Franz Barden, Initiation into Hermetics by Franz Barden. And he was a, was a great, great teacher, a great, great teacher. And his specialization was Hermetics or Egyptian magic right? It's a mystery school. And uh, we are part of that school in pranic healing and our hatha yoga. So <clears throat> each of the elements, earth, fire, water, and um, air, all have elements, elementals connected to that realm. So when you light, a, when you take a cigarette, right? And you light that cigarette with fire, the fire elemental interacts with the tobacco and it creates a certain kind of energy that penetrates the energy body of a person. And so you have elementals and then entities in the inner world that are attracted to that kind of energy. And then they merge with the person's energy body. And that's how addiction happens. Heroin, fire, and water elementals merging together with the substance and then that creates uh, the addiction within the person. So <clears throat> how do I put this? And then the fifth element is called Akasha. Akasha means beyond the physical. So in general, I don't recommend meditating on the elementals because they can make your life very chaotic especially the earth elementals so right you 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 know gnomes right gnomes the little tiny little teeny tiny guys those are earth beings earth elementals <coughs> so any of these things you never want to give them a name they have specific names in the inner world so if you're clairvoyant or clairaudient, you can literally connect with these beings and talk to them and you can summon them. 
but if you if you lack will and this goes to higher level teachings good white magicians have will to control the elements but most people lack that will so it's not that it's outside of our school you it's a it's a very specialization of how to use the elements in healing but if you interact with these beings you have to have very developed will and you also don't name them because when you name them it awakens them in different ways meaning if you saw a gnome an earth elemental in the inner world you could talk to it and give it a name that's not recommended. So I don't recommend doing meditations on these beings. So you have gnomes, you have uh, uh, syphilis, not saying it right. You have to look it up. That's the air elementals. You have salamanders, which are fire elementals. And then you have, um, what is it, the uh, sifts? as the water elementals. I mean, they're beautiful when you look at them, right? Because they're, they're, they're beings of a kingdom. They're very important. So, so all the pictures you guys saw of me having fires, different campsites around the Pacific Northwest, those beings are there. Those fire elementals are there. So if you're clairvoyant and you can look, you can connect to the beings and they can do things with the, with the fire, with the, wood that you give them because that's food for them so i don't recommend unless you have very developed will and a very specific purpose to use elementals i don't recommend connecting to them if you want to know more about it you can research hermetics because they they give you more tools on how to work with those beings but they can get out of control um next question are unicorns real Are unicorns real? Yes, but it depends on what you mean by real. Do you mean in the physical plane or in the energy plane, right? They don't exist physically, but they exist, exist energetically. So unicorns are, unicorns and pegasus are teachers in the inner world. And also a unicorn is a development of the forehead chakra. So we talked about King Solomon before, huge forehead chakra, right? A teacher of wisdom. So they are real. And it's interesting that how the great ones introduce teachings into the mainstream culture, because if you ask people, modern people, hey, do you like unicorns? I love unicorns. What is a unicorn? I have no idea. It's a mythical creature. Exactly. So that's called basically surface level or level one understanding, right? They're taking something mythical and just seeing it, oh, it's a, it's a horse with a, a horn. What is that? They don't know. Then you have to go symbolic, then you have to go energetic. So, but yes, unicorns are real energetically and they either represent a teacher or they represent a certain kind of development of the forehead chakra. That's the unicorn light. <clears throat> which I had the opportunity many, many years ago to scan the energy of the unicorn light coming out of one of the masters in chronic healing. And it's very, very strange. It's unlike anything you can scan that, that I've scanned before, right? You can scan a chakra. It feels like this. <clears throat> you scan an aura. It feels like this. You scan prosperity energy, poverty energy, happiness, sadness, depression, fear. They all have certain qualities that your energy body can identify. Like, oh yeah, that's that feels like stress. It's like hanging out with someone who's stressed and you just like, I know they have a smile on their face, but they feel, I feel their stress inside of me. But scanning the unicorn light, unlike anything I've ever scanned before, it's very um, hard to explain. Even now, I don't know how to explain it to you. But what it does is it penetrates the inner world so it extracts information like a like a vacuum cleaner so if you want to know something so the great great teachers like charles ledbetter who's one of the greatest clairvoyants of the 20th century who's from the theosophical society 
in, uh, in England, and he was very, very developed clairvoyant. So when he would look at you in one look, he'd know everything about you. It's like an MRI machine for the energy world. One of the people that was like that in Planet Killing was Meg Mike, Master Choa's um, co-worker. But it's very rare to find people that have that development of the forehead chakra. But the great teachers, they're looking at you through the forehead or they're looking at you with the crown. This is form. This is no form. So they know something without seeing anything. This is that they know something by seeing the form of it. But I can tell you firsthand, as you develop your higher faculties, your ability to cut to the heart of the matter is like that. You're not wasting so much time in the weeds. You're not using your ajna so much to figure things out <clears throat> or you have to study. I got to read a book. I got to go to a podcast. I got to watch a video on YouTube. I got to get more knowledge. But if the forehead and the crown are developed, you just know. No study, zero. No study is required. But that takes years and years and years of development, right? It's not overnight. Uh, next question. Can you please share your knowledge and understanding of the Dharma wheel and its connection to the four noble truths and the eightfold path? Okay, so the Dharma wheel, I'm not an expert in. I'm not an expert in Buddhism. My specialization is in esoteric teachings, practical spirituality, how to take something esoteric, hidden, and, and understand it to apply it into your day-to-day -day life. So I am not an expert in the Dharma wheel, and I don't want to direct anyone off their, off their path. So Dharma simply means your purpose. So karma is fruit, cause and effect, right? So what's the karma? I plant this, what am I getting? What's the effect? I do this, what's the effect, right? Dharma is how do you, you're born with certain abilities right? In certain karma. And the goal is always what? Oneness. Oneness with God, oneness with the higher soul. That's it. Everything is supporting that. Everything you do in life is supporting oneness. So you go, okay, these are my ninja powers. These are my deficits. How can I use my ninja powers to manifest goodwill in the world, right? So one of my ninja powers is speaking, right? It's very easy for me to articulate certain things. So that's me using my ninja power to do good in the world. Other people are good at, um, like for, for instance, mechanical things. Engineers, blows my mind. I don't know how they do it. Like what Elon Musk does and what he, how he knows what he knows is beyond my understanding because it's not my specialization. So he's using his engineering mind to transform the world, right? Other people do it through music, through pottery, through um, finance through nonprofits, right? So people use their certain abilities, their ninja powers, and then manifest the goodwill in the world. So that's your dharma. What's your dharma? Why am I here? Some of you have read the um, Understanding Your Purpose PDF that I, I created a couple of years back. Like, I don't know why I'm here. That, that PDF will help you have greater clarity <clears throat> and kind of break up some of the calcified ideas about like, Oh, it's supposed to hit me in the head like a like a hammer. Like I'm supposed to be a nurse. It doesn't, it's not like that. It's a misunderstanding. It's it's how we are in our culture. It's programming. So um, so it's connection to the four noble truths and the eightfold path. Well, the four noble truths is is basically um, there is suffering in life, suffering can end. This is the medicine for, uh, this is the, this is how you end suffering. And then we go into the eightfold path. So it's basically saying like, yeah, this is, this is what's going on with life. Um, one of the things in Buddhism is life is suffering. <clears throat> and that one misunderstanding, which is, <laughs> which it's funny when you think about it, the most important thing is viewpoint. All suffering comes from wrong viewpoint. But the translation in Buddhism that most people are in alignment with is 
life is suffering. So the premise itself, the viewpoint is wrong. Isn't that ironic? We're talking about viewpoint and the viewpoint is wrong. It's not that, suff that, that life is suffering, it's that there is suffering in life. And then you ask the question, well, why is there suffering in life? Ah, unrealistic expectations is primarily the case. Wrong viewpoint, unrealistic expectations. <clears throat> Can suffering end? Yes. What's the path to ending that suffering? Eightfold path. What's the first step? Right viewpoint. Seeing something accurately. What's the most important viewpoint? I'm the soul. I'm not the body. I'm not my feelings. I'm not my thoughts. I'm not my bank account. I'm not my house. I'm not my car. I'm not my family. I am the soul, right? So that I, actually, I just had that realization because many Western Buddhists say life is suffering. Well, if life is suffering, then what's the point, right? If life is suffering, then who cares? Then, just, then, then why work on improving? Why work on healing? Why work on becoming better? Why work on doing your spiritual or religious practices? If life is suffering and none of it matters, right? It's kind of nihilistic, then why do anything? So that viewpoint taints the rest of that person's practices versus there is suffering in life. And then we go to the Eightfold Path. Uh, we go to the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Ta-da. The benefit of having a great teacher to guide the path, right? <clears throat> uh, next question. If one, if one keeps desiring to hop from one job to another and hunt for better pay, better opportunities, in the perfect place where he or she feels happy, what's wrong energetically? What virtue is lacking and what needs to be worked out? If one keeps desiring... Okay, so do you guys know what the definition of a, an addiction is in, in the world of pranic healing? No? Okay. So an addiction from the energetic standpoint is an unwholesome, unregulated, excessive desire. Unwholesome, unregulated, excessive desire. So is there a problem with having a desire of having a job that pays you more? No, right? It's a wholesome, healthy, regulated desire. So desire, the seed of desire is in the solar plexus chakra. So your desire to live a good life, your desire to earn money, your desire to travel, your desire to have good things comes from the solar plexus. Me, myself, and I, self-interest, right? So you're saying, hey, I just got this job. Actually, I, I dated somebody who just got a job making... Where did she go up to? I don't, I don't remember. She went up to like... $90,000, which was a $15,000 increase from what she was previously making. And then guess what? She was already on the lookout for another job to, to pay her six figures. Anything wrong with that? Nope. Right? It's a healthy, wholesome desire. Now, if she was constantly in a state of dissatisfaction and unfulfillment, then it becomes a what? unregulated desire. So then it becomes an addiction. Then it becomes unhealthy. Then it becomes unwholesome. So there's nothing wrong with wanting more, 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 expanding, 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 but you have to have it in its proper place and perspective. So the question is, what virtue is not being practiced? On one level, moderation and non-excessiveness, meaning you don't have to work to, you don't have to work yourself to death to make millions of dollars but it's okay to make millions of dollars. Does that make sense? If you're working a hundred hours a week, you have no time with your family, you have no time to take care of your health, you're exhausted all the time, but you're making millions of dollars, you're not practicing the virtue of moderation and not excessiveness, right? But then let's say you're not being very industrious, you don't have much desire, but you can barely pay your bills on time. What virtue are you lacking? Moderation with work. So you have to be more moderate. You're working one hour a day, two hours a day. I know people like this, but you're not producing the results that you need to fulfill your commitments, your promises, your obligations. So you need to be moderate with your work schedule. So you do your 
eight hours of sleep, you do your eight hours of work, you do your little bit of gym time, right? So everything has its place. Also, it's a lack of industriousness, which is the virtue of constancy of aim and effort and non-laziness. So that person is not being industrious to bring their life to the next level. Because, and this took me a long time to figure out, when you do goodwill in the world, when you help people, when you grow as a soul and you impact the lives of more and more people, you know what that does? It expands your soul. So when you write a book, you put the book on Amazon, you have 10 people read that book, that book is connected to you, right? And now that person and person and person's lives have been improved, which expands you. You help foster children and you expand their minds and you leave an imprint on them and expand your consciousness. All the great, great spiritual teachers who have done tens of thousands or millions of healings or taught tens of thousands or millions of disciples or souls, they're expanding their soul. They're expanding their consciousness through the principle of oneness. So when you're lazy, when you lack industriousness, you're not allowing the soul to expand, right? But as you give, as you contribute, as you're being generous to the world, your soul is growing and expanding. So it's an interesting question. There's nothing wrong with, with having the desire to live a good life, but you have to be practicing moderation, not excessiveness, and constancy of aim and effort for the non-laziness. And here's the thing, the, you know how we have talk about light, love, and power, right? The three qualities of the soul which represent the virtues, the virtue that balances those energies out is moderation and not excessiveness. That's the harmonizing factor. That's why it's very difficult because you have to have discernment and go, well, wait a minute. Do I need to be more loving in this moment in time? Do I need to be more willful or do I need to be more intelligent? What needs to happen? So if, if this person looks at their life they go, wow, I'm jumping from job to job to job to job. I'm not really practicing constancy of aim and effort and non-laziness. But if the question is, I'm jumping from job making 50,000, I jump to another job making 75,000, I jump to another job making 95,000, I jump to another job making 150,000, that's good. But if the person's jumping from one job to the next job to the next job to the next job, all making the same or less income, not smart. Not practicing constancy of aim and effort and non-laziness. Right? So the, so all the virtues are connected, if you haven't figured this out by now. They're all connected. But sometimes you need to invoke and awaken one virtue or one quality more so than the other one in order to move the plan forward. Okay. <clears throat> Next question. During the silence of meditation, I tell my mind, let go. I am protected. I am safe. I had deepest meditation ever last few days. I experienced going through tunnel of dark void, then eventually tunnel of light. What is that experience? So the dark, the dark is a transition point. So you're sitting, you're meditating, and you see a light. Some people see that light for weeks, months, sometimes even years. They see that light, right? And then one day, the light's gone. And they're like, oh, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? God, please, right? So they think they, think they did something wrong or why they're not seeing the light anymore. They're in a void. They're in a dark transition period. And then they access greater light after that. And it could be months or years later. So we don't want to be attached. Here's the thing. Do not be attached to your experiences. Meditate on the meditation. Don't meditate on your experience. Right? Meditate on the meditation. Don't meditate on your experience. Because here's the thing. This is difficult for people to wrap their heads around. Even people who have been meditating for a long time. Because they meditate with the expectation of having whatever going somewhere, seeing something, um, 
having a, a, a strong feeling of bliss, right? Which is great. Those are all side benefits, but do you realize those are not of the soul? What's your purpose of meditating? The incarnated soul becoming one with the higher soul, and then the higher soul becoming one with the divine spark. That's it. So when you get blissed out, you're still on a lower level plane. So then you identify with those things, which then gets you off what? Track. You're like, that was such a beautiful meditation. I'm going to go for another beautiful meditation. And then there you go. You're lost in the sauce, as it were. You just go, no, I'm just going to do my meditation practice. That's it. What's the protocol? I sit. Okay, I tap my heart, tap my crown, et cetera, et cetera. Right? That's it. Because you start meditating on your experiences, which keeps you, which, which, And closes the soul's experience. Because what's the soul? Infinite, ever expanding, immortal. But if I say bliss, you, you took the tremendous expansion and infiniteness of the soul and put it into this little experience that, in general, it's the emotional body feeling it. Well, you're not your emotional body, right? You're not your thoughts. You're not the mind. You are the soul. So I'm not, I'm not saying that if you have a beautiful experience of meditation, that you should just throw it in the garbage and be done with it. Be like, whatever, I'm the soul. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying don't become attached to the experience. You have a great meditation? Awesome. You have a crappy meditation? Awesome. Did you do the meditation? Yes. That's all you need to do. Okay. Um, let go. I am protected. I am safe. Yeah, um, people have trauma and trust issues partly, and then they take that into their meditation, right? So it's hard for them to let go because they don't feel safe in the physical world, which is right in front of them, right? They can see it, they can taste it, they can touch it, right? And then you're telling them, let go into the abyss. <laughs> well, what does that mean? What are you talking about? I don't even know what the abyss is, right? So it requires a greater leap of faith so, but that's why we always say at the end of the meditation, be still, be aware, and let go. And you're going, well, be still of what? What am I being, what's, what's being still? Your bodies. Because when you're still, you go higher. Just naturally, you don't have to force it. Just be still. And then being aware. Being aware of what? Being aware of the I am. Well, what is that exactly? It's not something you're mentalizing. You're just, okay, be still. I'm not moving. All right, be aware. All right, I am the I am. And then you're gone like that. Also, at what point I, at one point, I felt or thought I was not breathing. So mind brought me back to body and I was breathing heavily. What is that experience? It's not really the mind, it's more the astral connected to breath. So when you're, stu when you're super, super still, when you're not moving, right? You're just super still. What happens is the chakras open up more and they start spinning faster really, really fast. Then you start bringing down a tremendous amount of prana. Then your body needs less physical energy because it's getting fed energy from the inner world. So you don't need to breathe. Now, do am I saying that should be your focus? No, it's a byproduct of proper meditation. So when you're super still and you're very deep in the meditation, your chakras are spinning super fast and feeding your bodies. So you don't need to breathe because the energy is already coming down. The reason we're breathing is because we're bringing in energy from the soul. That's why it's called pranayama, breath of life, prana, ruhak, right? You're inhaling and exhaling. So when you inhale, 
It's your soul exhaling. Did you catch that? When you inhale, it's your soul exhaling because it's giving you prana. And then when you exhale, it's your soul inhaling. So when we die, what do we do? Do we take our, our last forever inhale or do we take our last exhale? Our last exhale. And that's the soul absorbing you. You absorbing you. The big you absorbing the little you. Pranayama. Very, very powerful. Okay. Next question. How many minutes uh, are Hanuk practitioner and non-practitioner of meditation one should do for following mantras and what to do in between the chant of the mantra? So the Gayatri mantra, Nama Rama mantra, Nama Shivaya mantra, Lakshmi mantra, Om Mani Padme Hom mantra, Nama Para Brahma mantra. How many minutes? Um, it depends. It's a good question. It really depends on the mantra and what the effect that you're going for. Um, so with most all the mantras, chanting them 108 times is recommended. That's if you have a lot of time, which that's getting into mantra yoga, right? That's a whole specific school of spiritual practices, mantra yoga. Using sacred sounds to create certain effects, okay? So you can chant 108 times, or you can do nine times. So you can chant it nine times, or you can do 10 minutes. So you can chant 108 or nine times or 10 minutes of chanting. If you're listening to a recording of Master Choa or another teacher chanting, you let him chant, and then you chant with him the next time. Then you let him chant, then you chant with him the next time. You can chant in the silence, but it's better if you let him chant, be aware of the silence, then chant with him the next time, be aware of the silence. So when the teacher chants, right? Let's say, Om Mani Padme Hom. When the teacher chants, the energy is coming down. Then when you chant the next time, you're absorbing that energy. Make sense? So again, you can chant 108 times. You can chant nine times. You can chant for 10 minutes. Also, you want to chant with understanding of what you're chanting. Understand the mantra. Yes, you will get benefit chanting Om Mani Padme Hom if you don't speak Sanskrit, get it. But if you understand deeply what it is that you're chanting and you have reverence for that chanting, it will have a much, much more profound effect on you psychologically, emotionally, and physically. As for whether you're an Arhatic practitioner or non Arhatic practitioner, doesn't matter. Okay, next question. How do I deal with fear? How do I deal with fear? Good question. So where's fear? Solar plexus, solar plexus, primarily in the solar plexus because <clears throat> fear is an emotion, right? So if someone has a tremendous amount of fear, it's typically from a phobia and trauma that tore webbing in the chakra many, many years ago. Fear of drowning, being attacked by a dog. I had both. I was attacked by a dog when I was young. I don't have a fear of animals because it wasn't my karma to be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It wasn't my karma to be terrified by animals, right? But water, ancient. I have a problem with being in water above my head. I can swim fine. In a pool, I'm like a boss, like a fish, a fish in water. But in a lake, a pond, a river, an ocean, if it's above my head, 
there, there's a phobia, there's a fear that I have around that. It's irrational. It's super funny. I asked Chris, who is an avid, oh, Indiana, you're adorable. Well, everything, I mean, a cup of water is above your head. So um, Chris is a famous, a famous scuba diver. <laughs> he could be, could be holding out on us. And I asked him, I go, I go, what are the chances? Because I always sense something is down there no matter if it's a lake, a pond or whatever, but especially the ocean. And he goes, statistically speaking, it's more likely for you to be um, hit by lightning than to be attacked by a shark. He goes, it's so rare, it would blow your mind. He goes, of all the millions of scuba divers around the world, there's like three cases a year of like a shark attack. And even that, it's people who are not following protocol. They're teasing the, the, the sharks. They're like putting in like chum into the water right next to them. You know what I'm saying? Like they're putting themselves in a position to be attacked by a shark. Yeah, I love the water being there and looking at it. Oh, yeah, well, there you go. So my fear is irrational. I just never done healing around it because it's not like it controls my life or anything. So fear is something in the chakra, primarily the solar plexus, that needs to be removed. That's all. You just go into the solar plexus, you disintegrate it using electric violet light, and then you heal the webbing using electric violet light. And over time, the fear goes away. Because all it is, is it's an energy. That's it. You have real fear right? Somebody's chasing you in a dark hallway with a knife. That's real fear. Then you have imaginary fear. Most fear is imaginary. So it's an energy that needs to be removed from your system, from your solar plexus, and primarily the throat. Um, so one way of dealing with fear, removing it energetically. Number two, having understanding. Because it's, an, it's irrational meaning the person is not using their rational mind. Like when Chris explained to me, hey, Christian, rationally, of the millions of scuba divers around the world, there's three shark attacks, and these people are asking for it. So the likelihood of you being eaten by a shark in the ocean is super, super unlikely. And I was like, huh. So with that understanding, it did what? It alleviated my suffering, and then it gave me, it took away the fear. Right? It took away the fear. Not entirely, because the energy is still there. But now I have more understanding. Okay? Um, so getting healing, getting understanding. What else with fear? Here's a big one that most people don't do. Run at it. Run at it. Master Choa says you have fear in the physical world and you have fear in the energy world. He says the fear that is preventing you from going where you are to where you want to be, if you ran at it, you would understand experientially, not intellectually, that it's just paper mache. It's hollow. There's no substance, right? So people have a, a fear of public speaking. Guess what? As you keep running towards that, as you keep ex experiencing it more and more, the fear goes away. So you have understanding, but you also have experiential understanding. So there's nothing to fear but fear itself, right? Eleanor Roosevelt. So that's something I would recommend people look, look into. It's like, if you want to do something, do it. And through the process of doing it, you will become more courageous and less fearful. Right, me going on this trip, I wouldn't say fear, but uncertainty, but I did it anyways, because I choose what I do and what I don't do, not my emotional body. Does that make sense? Next question, how can I balance the feminine and masculine energies in my body? Good Lord, big question. I'm not gonna be able to answer it 
all with our time. Um, okay, so you have an egg, right? A female egg, what a woman has in her body, right? You have the sperm, right? You bring them together, you have life. So the egg is the yin. The sperm is the yang. The egg is the form. The sperm is the energy. So from a spiritual viewpoint, the disciple is the yin. The teacher is the yang. The teacher introduces energy into your form to help you grow and evolve. What's the form? The form of the soul in the form of the bodies. So masculine and feminine energies are within all of us and some have predominant. So there are certain women that are more masculine than feminine and there are certain men that are more feminine than masculine. We need both energies. The problem is most people are lacking yin and they have a they have disharmonious yang. So most people are lacking feminine energy, which is form, which is the love aspect, which is nurturing, which is providing. And then the yang is distorted. That's where the term toxic masculinity comes into play. It's a disharmonious masculine energy. But we have Per, uh, we have a man and a woman meet each other and both of them are depleted of yin. Both of them are looking for love. Both of them are looking for their cups to be filled, but both of them go into the relationship to take. This is a general statement, but most people lack yin. So if you develop the yin and the yang energies within yourself and they are relatively balanced, guess what happens? the partner you attract is relatively balanced. So if you're way on one end of the spectrum, you're going to attract somebody on the way other end of the spectrum. Right? So that's a very simple way of putting it. But a teacher that can help with that is Lord Buddha Kuan Yin. The teacher who can help with yin, with love, with nurturing, with nourishing, with providing, with supporting is that teacher. But it requires lots of removing of programs. It's not, it's not easy. I did, um, I initially did this work uh, three years ago, the yin and the yang, and it was not easy. It was very foreign, very, very foreign to me. But then I, as I became more harmonious and balanced, I was like, wow, this is amazing. So that's what I'll say for the time being. We might be able to elaborate on that in future Q and A's. Hey, meditation gang. <laughs> I'm a yo-yo meditator with little, I don't know, a yo-yo. I'm a yo-yo meditator. With a little knowledge about, with a little knowledge, Christian, read it correctly. With a little knowledge, but during this really stressful time in my life, I need to regulate my practice. Back to moderation, not excessiveness, right? I want an app or a book to educate me further. Similar guidance, motivation, and knowledge is calm worth paying for. So calm is an app. Calm, C-A-L-M is an app that you can get. Any books or apps you recommend that don't break the bank? I'm very busy person too. So no books the size of L-O-T-R or anything. I don't, sending love. <laughs> it's kind of a, all over the place. Number one, anyone who thinks they're too busy to meditate doesn't understand the purpose of meditation. <clears throat> when you meditate, you receive energy, right? When you meditate, you become empowered. When you meditate, you experience the qualities of the soul. When you meditate, you have a clearer mind, right? So that excuse doesn't hold water. 
when you say, I'm too busy to meditate, it's nonsense. Complete nonsense. Anyone, I don't care who you are, what your background is, how busy your schedule is, doesn't matter. If you say you don't have 25 minutes to meditate, you're lying to yourself. It's self-delusion. It's not accurate. Not accurate, even a little bit. Okay. The benefit you get from meditating far outweighs the 20, 25, 30 minutes of time investment. Um, I want an app or a book to educate me further. Spiritual guidance. So this, this person basically needs kind of the, the whole rundown. So what I would recommend to this person is learn Twin Hearts Meditation, take a class, plug into the system. Um, attend the retreats. Motivation. Hmm. So motivation in general comes from the solar plexus, emotional will. So getting somebody jacked up to do something isn't, isn't, it doesn't, it's not sustainable. It really congests and depletes the solar plexus if you're always having to be jacked up. So it's better to be divinely inspired. That's why Master Choa's Golden Lotus, Golden Lotus Sutra books, the little tiny books, it says inspired action. That's the book for people who want to become pranic healing instructors. You have to be inspired to do your work, right? So it's not about beating yourself up. It's not about forcing yourself. Like It's not getting amped up to do your meditation practice because what's the purpose of that? Think about it. When you sit down to meditate, do you want to be jacked up? Do you want to be emotionally agitated? Do you want to be excited? Woo! It's like this. All right, I'm going to meditate. <gasps> right? That's crazy. But that's but I'm saying it to you guys because that's how people think and feel. I got to be motivated to meditate. I got to be motivated to do forgiveness. I got to be motivated to do my gratitude, right? It's not about that. That's being emotionally run. You just come from here. What's the right thing to do? Okay, I do my meditation at eight o'clock, 8, 8.30 every day. That's it. I put in my calendar. It's a priority. Everything else can wait. Done and done. That's it. Ta-da. Takes the emotion out of it. Takes the squirreliness out of it. It takes the up and down out of it. You're just like, here's the schedule. Done and done. Master Choa says you have to, A, remove distractions. B, you have to have a set, set time and place to do your practice. That's it. A little hard to do on the road, but you get the point, right? So you go, all right, I meditate at 8.30 or 10 o'clock or 7.30 at night, rain, sleet, or shine. That's it. That's it. So you don't have to be motivated. It's not about motivation. Even a little bit. You can't motivate yourself to be still. Hello. I'm so excited I'm going to be still right now. Right? It's, it's not clear thinking. And last question. Dun, dun, dun. Why is gratitude so important? This I could talk about for hours. Gratitude is super, super duper, 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 duper important. Some of you may remember in 2019 when I did the 21 day spiritual vacation with Master Glenn and Master Mary like Mendoza in Bovina, New York. Every hour of the 21 days, we did gratitude. We did 30 minutes on understanding gratitude in this little teeny tiny nugget niche area of our lives or globally, right? It depends on what we were focusing on. And then we spent 30 minutes practicing, 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 practicing gratitude. <clears throat> and then Around the 14th day, I had my epiphany around heart opening because my heart was hurting so much, hurting so much. Like I felt like somebody was punching me in the chest day one, day two, days. I was like, why does this hurt so much? And like maybe the fifth or sixth day, I was like, Master Mary, like, what's the deal? We're practicing gratitude and I feel like somebody's punching me in the chest. And she goes, because your heart's expanding and it's not used to expanding that much that quickly. I go, is this going to end? She goes, it'll be fine. 
I was like, okay, fine, right? So moving forward, I wasn't motivated. I was like, okay, I just have to keep doing it. So on day 14, I had one of the most profound spiritual experiences of my entire life. But Christian, you said, don't acknowledge these spiritual experiences because they're not, you understand what I'm saying, right? Always go high and you can always go higher. But in that moment, my heart was super, super expanded and I felt blissed out and healed like that. All the pain, sharpness, heaviness in my heart was gone, completely gone. And I went up to her and I go, I figured out what the missing ingredient was to make gratitude so powerful. And she knew what, she knew what I was going to say. So her eyes were getting all big. And I go, it's sincerity, isn't it? And she goes, exactly. Sincerity is the missing ingredient. Sincerity is the, like the gunpowder that makes gratitude happen. Because so many people do so many practices half half-heartedly, right? And they never really see receive the benefit that they're quote unquote promised. Yeah, I read this book about practicing gratitude by practice gratitude, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, but where is your sincerity in your practice? Where's the reverence for your practice, right? So gratitude does a couple things. When you're grateful, it pulls something into your auric field faster, right? So it helps you materialize things faster. Conversely, ingratitude pushes something out of your aura or cancels it entirely. How many people do you know, watch, this will be a self-evident truth. How many people do you know who are ingrateful live miserable lives? People that you know that are just not grateful people. True or not true? They live miserable lives. Yes? How many people do you know that may not be the best looking, may not be the fittest, may not be the wealthiest, but have lots of gratitude and live great lives? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Right? Exactly. Gratitude is so powerful. It's so transformative. If I could just spend the next 24 hours hammering that into your mind and your energy bodies, I would. It's amazing. But again, it's a spiritual teaching that's hiding in plain sight. Because we hear it so often. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'll give you an example. How many of us breathe? <laughs> right? I know I breathe every single day. But if you were taught how to breathe properly, i.e. learning pranayama, it would change your entire life. It's a, it's a secret hiding in plain sight, right? So gratitude is the same thing. We hear gratitude. Yeah, yeah, gratitude's great. Forgiveness. Yeah, super important. Yeah, meditation. Yeah, yeah, great, great, great. But no one's practicing it regularly. And not no one, obviously, but most people are not practicing it regularly and they're not practicing it sincerely. That's the missing ingredient. I use the example that if, if you gave me a present, for my birthday, <clears throat> June 3rd, if you gave me a present for my birthday and I, I took it from you, I said, oh, thanks, and threw it on the bed or threw it on the couch, how would you feel that I received it? Not so well, but I was grateful, right? I said, thank you. But if I looked you in the eyes and I activated my heart and I showed sincerity in my thanking, I would be deeply impacted and you would be deeply impacted, right? So that's what I'm trying to get you to look at, not just with gratitude, but all areas of your life, that sincerity and that reverence for what you're doing. Super important, super, super important. Don't take what I'm saying lightly. Gratitude will change your life. And it's funny because you don't need to practice gratitude for for five years for 30 minutes a day to receive the benefit. If you just spent 15 minutes of sincere gratitude for the things that you're grateful in life, the things you're grateful that is coming in your life, the things you're grateful that other people are experiencing in their lives, any kind of gratitude, your entire energy body will be shifted dramatically, dramatically, like as powerful, if not more than a healing. So don't take it lightly.
whenever I've been in really sticky situations, I can't get my energy to that point of like healing or feeling better or something's just not working. I sit down, I'd be aware of my heart and I'd be super, super grateful, grateful for what's happening, the ailment, the condition, the pain, the whatever energy is coming up that I don't like. I'm grateful for it because it's teaching me something. It's bringing me back to the love, the self. So at the very least, thank you for giving me the opportunity to practice merging and connecting with the higher self. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And you'll like that. But nobody gets how powerful that is. I mean, think about that. Just being grateful. You have a severe physical or emotional pain. You have awareness. Okay, gratitude. You focus on the heart. You practice gratitude sincerely and the pain goes away in 10 minutes. Are you kidding me? You can't buy medication that does that. So I hope that helps. I hope my soapbox inspired you to start practicing gratitude more often. <clears throat> but again, I thought I knew about gratitude for years and we did 21 hours of different aspects of gratitude and it was life transformative. Super grateful for it, okay? Ta-da, we finished, woo! I hope you got value from it. If you didn't, I don't know what to tell you. Um, so we will be doing meditation on Sunday. I'll be doing it from here. And then I will be in Sedona this coming Monday at 10, 15 a.m. I'm waiting four hours at the airport for this person to pick me up with her sons. <clears throat> and then it's gonna be a barn burner for the next two months. Looking forward to it. Um, yeah, that's it. Everything's good. We are closing. Place your hands on your heart. <clears throat> Be aware of your heart. Be aware of your crown. Be aware of your heart and your crown together with sincerity, with reverence. See, do you notice the difference? To the Supreme God, Divine Father, Divine Mother, the Grand Master Cho Huxui, Lord Mahaguru Jamili, the Lord Buddha Kuan Yin, the Lord Ganesh, to Saraswati, to Holy Master Count Saint Germain, to all the Holy Gurus, Holy Masters, Saints, Archangels, Holy Angels, Healing Angels, Healing Ministers, to the Angels of Understanding, to our Divine Selves, our Higher Souls, we thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for being merciful with us. Thank you for being there for us to guide us to higher truths, to greater understanding, to deeper transformation. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you all. With gratitude, respect, and love, so be it. Thank you. All right, everyone. Lots of love to each and every one of you. Thank you for spending some time with us. I'm so glad <laughs> I have Wi-Fi. It's a blessing. Grateful for the Wi-Fi. Yay. And uh, I'm going to post this up on the site in a minute. Uh, thanks, Leaf. And um, thanks, Indiana. Get it, girl. Um, and then I will uh, I'll post this on the site. And keep sending your questions. Just send them um, Facebook Messenger or email. ChristianRlong at gmail.com. Love you guys. Bye. Oh, I got to do the recording thing. Stop the recording. Bye-bye.